Chapter 18. The Mirror World. My world takes care of me. The Dual Mirror. The manifestations of reality take two forms. The physical, that which can be touched, and the metaphysical, that which lies beyond the realms of perception. Both types of manifestation exist simultaneously, each form penetrating and complementing the other. Dualism is an integral part of our world, and many things are comprised of opposites. When you stand in front of a mirror, you represent a real, living, physical object. Your reflection, on the other hand, has no material substance. It is metaphysical, imaginary, and yet just as real as the object reflected. The whole world can be seen as a gigantic dual mirror. On one side of the mirror lies the physical universe, and on the other side of the mirror lies the metaphysical alternative's space. In the dual mirror, unlike in any ordinary mirror, the material world serves as a reflection of the intention and thoughts of God, as well as all the living beings that are the embodiment of Him. The alternative space is like a matrix or template, which is used for the cut, the stitching, and the fashion show for the movement of all matter. The alternative space contains information relating to what can happen in the material world and how. The number of possible realities it contains is infinite. Each alternative represents a sector of the field that is made up of scripts and scenery, i.e. a trajectory for the movement of matter. In other words, the sector determines what will happen in each specific case and what it will look like. The mirror, therefore, separates the world into two halves, the actual and the imaginary. Everything that has acquired material form lies in the real half and develops in accordance with the laws of natural science. Science, as well as the conventional worldview, is only applicable to what happens in quote-unquote reality. Reality is usually understood to mean everything that is subject to observation or direct impact. If you take away the metaphysical side of reality and only take into account the material world, the activity of all living beings, including man, is reduced to primitive movement within the limits of inner intention. As we know, using inner intention, a goal can be reached by means of direct impact on the environment. In order to achieve a goal in this way, you have to take certain steps, push and shove, elbow your way forward, and do a specific job. Material reality is physically tangible. It responds instantly to direct impact, which creates the illusion that this is the only way in which results can be achieved. However, in the realms of the material world, the range of realistically achievable goals is significantly narrowed. You can only count on things that are present. Everything depends on finances which are usually lacking and opportunities that are severely limited. Absolutely everything in this world is seeped in the spirit of competition. Too many people want to achieve the same thing, and there is not enough for everyone, at least within the realms of inner intention. So where do we get the conditions and circumstances that are essential to achieving our goals? This is where they come from, the alternative space. On that side of the mirror, there is an abundance of everything, and there is no competition. The goods are not physically present, but the great thing is, you can choose anything as if from a catalog, and then place an order. Sooner or later, the order will be fulfilled and you will not even have to pay for it. You have to observe certain manageable conditions, but that is all. Sound like a fairy tale? It is far from it. It is more than realistic. Thought energy does not ever disappear without a trace. It is capable of materializing a sector of the alternative space that corresponds in quality to the thought energy being radiated. It only appears that everything in life is the result of the interaction between material objects. Processes that take place in the subtle planes actually play no less an important role in the physical incarnations of alternatives that exist in the virtual dimensions. We rarely notice the element of cause and effect in subtle processes. Nonetheless, they form the greater half of our reality. As a rule, the materialization of sectors in the alternative space takes place independently of one's will because, as human beings, we do not use thought energy in a deliberate, focused manner and this is even more the case with less developed beings. As we showed in the first part of Transurfing, the effect of mental images on reality mostly manifests in the form of our worst expectations. Being grounded in quote-unquote real life, people make their way along the empty shop shelves rushing 
to reach their hand out for a product that has already sold out. Only goods of a poorer quality are left, but even these are expensive. Rather than simply flicking through a catalog and making an order, people rush in random search for what they want, waiting in long queues and trying to somehow squeeze their way through the crowd only to get into arguments with the sales staffs and other buyers. The approach still does not give you what you want and you end up with more problems than you started with. This bleak picture of reality usually originates in the mind of the individual and gradually materializes transforming into physical reality. Every living being creates the layer of their world with their thoughts on the one hand and their direct actions on the other. All the layers arrange themselves one on top of the other as each living being contributes to the formation of reality. A layer is characterized by a specific set of conditions and circumstances which make up the way of life of an individual being. From now on, we refer to human beings specifically. Habitat conditions vary from favorable to scanty, comfortable to harsh, friendly to aggressive. Naturally, the environment in which a person is born plays an important role, but how their life will develop later largely depends on their attitude towards themselves and the world around them. Subsequent changes in lifestyle are largely determined by a person's mental outlook. The sector of the alternative space that becomes embodied will correspond in script and scenery to the nature and direction of that person's thoughts. So two factors take part in the creation of an individual layer of reality, inner intention on one side of the mirror and outer intention on the other. A person affects objects within the material world via direct connection, whereas with their thoughts they embody in physical reality things that are not yet present. If a person is convinced that all the best things in the world have already sold out, then in reality the shelves for them will remain empty. If they think that they will have to wait in a huge queue for hours and then pay a large sum of money, that is what will happen. If your expectations are pessimistic and filled with doubt, they will be instantly confirmed. If you expect to encounter a hostile environment, your premonition will be realized. However, if a person allows the innocent thought to permeate their being that the world has saved the cream for them, this too is what will become manifest. The eccentric who does not realize that nothing is meant to come easy turns up one day at a counter where they have literally just had a delivery of goods as if they had been brought in especially for him. It turns out that the first customer gets everything for free while behind him a long line is already forming of people who are convinced that the reality of life is much darker and eccentric fools are just lucky. Life is a game in which the world is constantly setting its inhabitants the same riddle. Go on, guess what I'm like? Everyone replies in accordance with their own perception of the world. You are aggressive, or you are cozy, or cheerful, sorrowful, friendly, hostile, happy, ill-fated. The interesting thing is that everyone wins the quiz. The world agrees and stands before each participant in the image they ordered. If the lucky eccentric decides to change their attitude once they come up against the quote-unquote realities of life, their world will change accordingly, throwing the enlightened fool to the very back of the line. This is how the individual creates the layer of their world with their thoughts. The process can be explained using just a few simple principles. The first mirror principle is this. The world is like a mirror that reflects your relationship to it. The world literally consents to your thoughts about it. So why is it that our worst expectations are generally confirmed while our hopes and dreams do not come true? There are reasons for this and they are expressed in the second mirror principle. Reflection is formed in the unity of heart and mind. As long as the mind does not contradict the wishes of the heart and vice versa, an unfathomable power emerges outer intention, which materializes the sector of the alternative space that corresponds to the image of one's thoughts. In the unity of heart and mind, this image acquires clear contours and as a result is immediately embodied in physical reality. However, what usually happens in life is that the soul strives for something, but the mind is filled with doubt and will not allow the soul to follow the urge or the other way around. The intellect provides convincing arguments for something, but the heart remains indifferent. When unity is broken, the image becomes blurred. It is as if the image splits because the heart desires one thing and the intellect insists on another. There are only two things that bring the heart and mind together unconditionally, aversion and fear. For when a person hates, they do so with all their heart. And when they feel fear, it fills their whole being. 
In the unity of aversion, a clear image is generated depicting the thing you want to avoid. As two manifestations of reality, material and metaphysical, the heart and mind come together at the same point and the thought form is embodied in physical reality. As a result, you get whatever it is you cannot stand. Unlike fear, desires are not as easily fulfilled because in this case, our desire's unity is rarely achieved. The heart resists the mind because, having succumbed to influence of pendulums, it strives towards other people's goals. The mind, in turn, either fails to have any awareness of its innermost desires, or it does not believe in the possibility of their fulfillment. Some people believe that to achieve your goal, you have to clearly formulate your order, and then release the corresponding thought form into the universe, and then do nothing to avoid hindering its realization. If it were only that simple. This technique works only on the condition that the second mirror principle has been fulfilled. However, unity of heart and mind is only achieved in rare cases because it is almost impossible to be fully rid of treacherous doubts. So what should you do? This leads us to the third mirror principle. There is a delay in the reaction of the dual mirror. If you cannot fulfill the second principle, the fortress must be taken by lengthy siege. Try to imagine this rather unusual scenario. You stand in front of a mirror, but there is nothing there except emptiness. Only after a little time does the image of your reflection begin to appear, like in a photograph. At a certain point you smile, but the reflection still shows the same serious expression. You lift up your arms, but the mirror image remains the same. You put your arms down straight away, and again, nothing in the mirror has changed. In order to see your reflection with raised arms, you have to hold them up, for a longer period of time. The dual mirror works in exactly the same way, except that the time delay is much longer, and so the changes taking place in the mirror are practically imperceptible. Material realization is inert like tar. Nonetheless, a thought form, or slide as it is referred to in transurfing, can be materialized. All it requires is one basic condition. You have to run the slide in your mind systematically for a significant period of time. As you can see, the secret is simple, and this really is all it takes. It is hard to believe that it could be all so trivial. No magic, just ordinary, everyday effort. And it really works. It is just that most people do not have the patience to follow it through. They are lit up and inspired by some idea, but quickly lose their enthusiasm and file the idea for later. In order to materialize a thought form, you have to take specific steps to work with a slide. If you do not do the work, you cannot expect a miracle. How much time is needed to realize the slide depends on the complexity of the goal you have set. While the mind is in doubt that the goal can be realistically embodied, the image will remain hazy, but sooner or later, some kind of representation will begin to appear in the mirror. Then you will begin to see for yourself how outer intention opens the necessary doors and provides the necessary opportunities for you to reach the goal. This will assure the mind that the technique is bearing fruit and that the goal is in fact realistically achievable. Gradually, heart and mind will come to a position of unity, focusing on the radiation of thought energy into a sharper image. As a result, a reflection will be formed creating what is normally considered a miracle. The dream that seemed impossible is transformed into reality. The Reality Amalgam With the help of the slide technique described earlier on in Transurfing, you can successfully create an image which the world mirror will stream into physical reality. Aside from any concrete image, though, it would not be at all bad to maintain an unchanging background to the layer of your world that would consistently create a favorable atmosphere. You may have noticed in the past that your reflection is different when you look in one mirror than it does when you look in another. It is the same face, but every mirror brings out different nuances in the reflection. Very slight yet tangible differences are revealed such as the emotional coloring, mood, or even psychological type. Depending on the mirror, the reflection will be kind or angry, healthy or sickly, attractive or less so, and warm or cold. You might wonder what could account for the disparity, for the reflective surface of each mirror should objectively convey an exact copy of the same image. However, there are a range of factors that can have a tangible effect on the transmission of an image. Like in a photograph, a lot depends on lighting, background, and color of the mirror itself. Venetian mirrors were noted for their particular charm as early as in the Middle Ages. Venetian glass was renowned throughout the world for its fabulous quality, but it was not the glass that gave the mirror its special quality. 
People noticed that for some unknown reason, it was much more pleasant to admire their reflection in a Venetian mirror than in an ordinary mirror, as it gave the reflection of the face a noticeably more attractive look. It turned out that the Venetian masters had their own special secret. They would add gold to the amalgam, the composition of the mirror backing, which had the effect of making warm tones dominant in the reflective spectrum. You can perfect a small part of the dual mirror for yourself. To make the layer of your world more cozy, you can try mixing your own amalgam. The layer of your world consists on a multitude of different reactions relating to your relationship to yourself and to various manifestations in the world around you. It is essential to pick out one particular line within the spectrum of these relationships to determine the prevailing background. You could, for example, choose the following formula as dominant. My world takes care of me. People will readily express their attitude to life when they are dissatisfied with something, whereas when anything good happens, they take it for granted, almost indifferently. We do it unconsciously, reacting like oysters by force of habit. Now you can go beyond the level of the oyster, wake up and use the advantage that you can express your attitudes to life so consciously. Deliberately attune your outlook to align with the dominant idea, and then you will see how the mirror will react. It will be your first step on the path to shaping reality. Remember when you were a child, the world really did look after you, but you did not truly value it when taking it for granted. Look in the past. Perhaps you experienced this feeling when you were visiting your grandmother in the country. Cast your mind's eye back to those days in the distant past when you felt secure and serene. Fragments of memories can be very clear. It is as if a divine aroma is coming from the kitchen where your grandmother is still baking cakes. Or perhaps you are sitting on a riverbank with a fishing rod or sledging down a hill. What was it like then? Do you recall that feeling of serenity? It was like that then because the world did take care of you, and although you may have vaguely suspected it to be true, you would not have attributed it to anything in particular. That said, you would not then have had any particular complaints to make either. Everything was just fine. Even when a child is playing up, they do not put their heart and soul into their dissatisfaction. They will scream and stamp their little feet, waving their hands about, but the world still carries the child carefully and caringly, affectionately repeating, What is the matter, little one? Did you make a mess and get yourself all dirty? Let's go and clean it all up, shall we? As a person grows and develops, the world saves the best for them, making them gifts of exciting new toys and caring for them lovingly. The world takes care of its little charge, its favorite, its pet. The lucky child discovers all sorts of new pleasures while everything is new and fresh, unaware of the fact that they are enjoying life in the moment. The person understands this only many years later when they remember how good everything was in comparison to how it is now. So why is it then that with time all life's colors fade and light serenity is replaced with anxious concern? Perhaps it is because as we grow older, the number of problems we have to deal with increases. No. It is because as we grow up, we adopt the tendency to express a negative attitude. Dissatisfaction is a more powerful feeling than the satisfaction that comes from comfort and being at peace. Failing to understand that we are in fact happy now, despite everything, we demand more and more from the world. The charge's requests become bigger, and the charge itself more spoiled and unthankful. Naturally, the world cannot keep up with the charge's quickly growing needs, and the pet starts to make complaints, changing their attitude to the world. You are bad. You do not give me everything I want. You do not take care of me. At this point, the negative relationship is charged with all the power of the unfulfilled soul and the capricious mind. The world is a mirror, and so it can do nothing except throw its hands in dismay and reply, As you wish, my sweet. Let it be your way. As a result, reality as a reflection of human thought changes for the worse. When things get to this stage, a person has more reason to feel dissatisfied as a result of which their relationship to life breaks down even more. And so the former favorite and pet is transformed into a grump, shortchanged by fate and constantly complaining that the world owes him something. It's a sorry picture. People do not remember that they were the ones to ruin it all. Spotting certain less pleasant features in the mirror's reflection, they focus their attention on them until expressing their negative response becomes an automatic process. As a result, everything gets worse than it was before. 
In the reflection, reality gradually becomes dimmer, as does the image. This is why the layer of an individual's world loses its former brightness and becomes more and more dull and uncomfortable. However, you can bring it all back very simply. The feeling of calm serenity, the taste of ice cream as it was in your childhood, the feeling of newness, hope for something better, and the joy of life. You will not believe how easy it is. But you do not have to believe it. Try it. It does not occur to anyone that they can renew the layer of their world by taking control of their relationship to reality. Whatever you make of your perception of the world is what your world will become. This should not be interpreted as some wishy-washy challenge to look at life more optimistically, but as genuine steps to shaping your own reality. From this moment onwards, whatever happens, make it a rule to consciously control your outlook on life. It does not matter that right at this very moment things are not as good as you would like them to be. Things are not actually that bad, and they certainly could be a lot worse. There are no stones dropping from the sky, the earth is not in flames under your feet, and there are no wild animals chasing you. Indeed, the world has changed considerably since you cooled your relationship to it. Do you remember how it used to cradle you in its arms, feed you with grandma's cakes and tell you stories? Then you grew up and a wall of estrangement appeared between you and the outside world. Warm spontaneity grew into an estrangement, trust was replaced with fear, and friendship turned into cold calculation. Yet the world did not get angry and turn its back on you. It simply went quiet and walked beside you, deep in thought like an old friend offended by a cold welcome. Look around you. Your world is still taking care of you. He planted those flowers and those trees for you. You do not pay any attention to the sun, sky, or clouds, but imagine what life would be like if they were not there. In the evenings, after a hard day's work, you can enjoy a moment of relaxation and comfort while outside it pours down with rain and a cold wind blows. The world still feeds you and puts you to bed. The world looks at you and sighs in longing for those happier times. Yet you turn away and fall asleep thoroughly convinced that the world is not what it used to be and that the past can never be retrieved. The world has not changed. Just as a mirror never changes, it is your relationship to the world that has changed and with it reality as a reflection of your thoughts. Now rouse yourself, open your eyes, sit up in the bed, and look about you. It is the same world as it was before that took care of you, and with whom you once so enjoyed spending time. Imagine how delighted the world will be when you finally come around from the illusion. Now you are together again, and everything will be as it used to. Never again must you offend this old faithful servant with your thankless attitude. Most importantly, do not hurry. For according to the third mirror principle, he needs time to get back to his former self. Initially, you will need to show patience and self-control. You have to understand that this is part of your specific work on shaping your reality. The work you are going to do consists of the following. In any circumstance, even the most minor, confirm your amalgam formula. It does not matter what is happening, whether it is something good or bad. When something fortunate happens, do not forget to tell yourself that the world really is taking care of you. Cite this confirmation at every minor detail of life. When you come up against something that might disappoint you, make sure that even you tell yourself that everything is unfolding as it should according to the principle of the coordination of intention. However circumstances unfold, your reaction must be unwavering. The world is always looking after you, no matter what. If something happens and you are lucky, pay particular attention to what is happening. And if you are not lucky, observe the principle of the coordination of intention, and that way you will always remain on a successful lifeline. You do not have to know what dangers the world is protecting you from, or by what means it does so. Place your trust in the world. It is essential that you learn to trust. When a person finds themselves in a difficult position, they are more inclined to rely on themselves than hope things will turn out for the best. An adult will always insist, I can do it myself, so the world places them down on the ground and gives the opportunity to manage on their own. Okay, okay, my darling. Run along without my help then. Break the ice of mistrust. Every time you face a problem, even if it is relatively minor, say to yourself, I let my world take care of me. This does not mean that you should do absolutely nothing and sit there with your arms folded. It is a matter of adopting the thought that everything will turn out well of its own accord by default. The mirror will reflect your perception flawlessly. If that is how you perceive it to be, then let it be so. Make a habit of allowing the world to take care of you, from the tiny details of everyday life to the most important issues in your life. 
If you have walked out the door without an umbrella and it looks like it might rain, do not head back inside. Tell yourself, my world and I are going for a walk. Tell your world, you will look after me, won't you? Your world will of course answer you. Of course, my darling. You can boldly rely on your world. It will not rain, and if it does, the world will provide you with somewhere to shelter just in time. If things do not turn out so successfully, do not be offended or doubt bitterly whether the world takes care of you. Remember that you are standing in front of a mirror. All the mirror does is reflect your mental outlook, no more and no less. There is no point in getting upset and even less so on battling with your doubts. It is useless. Leave room for mistakes and setbacks. The most important thing is to hold to your overall course. You can rely on the world for all sorts of things if you allow it to take care of you. People are not capable of solving all their own problems. Give them to the world to deal with, for the world has immeasurably greater capacity to solve them than you do. For example, you cannot avoid all threats with the help of inner intention because the layer of your world intersects with numerous other layers. Rather than directing your intention toward your own safety, direct it towards creating a world that takes care of you and protects you. Then your world's intention will start working for you. Depending on what concerns you most, you can choose your own special amalgam. For example, you could choose one of the following. My world chooses the best for me. When I go to the alternatives flow, the world meets me halfway. I create the layer of my world with intention. My world protects me. My world eliminates my problems. My world takes care of things so that my life is easy and comfortable. I place an order and my world fulfills it. I might not know how to take care of myself for the best, but my world does know. Everything that happens contributes towards the realization of my intention and everything happens as it should. You can create a new, unique amalgam, or several for that matter. I should emphasize, though, that the most important thing is to be patient and not tire of stating the amalgam formula at every convenient instance. Persistent effort is only required initially until it becomes habit. From there onwards, it is all plain sailing. This simple technique is the key to a force more powerful than you would ever expect. You control reality by controlling your relationship to the world. The dual mirror will embody into physical reality areas of the alternative space in which the world takes care of your welfare. With time, you will create a very cozy reality. Prepare yourself for a magnificent cascade of pleasant events. I am not over-exaggerating for a moment. The layer of your world will literally become transformed in front of your very eyes. You will be surprised at how quickly things start to change, and in this moment you will realize that you will never look at the mirror of the world in the same way again. You will have experienced the rising wind of change. The wind will take care of you. You can be sure of that. Chasing your reflection. Each person creates the individual layer of their world, their own reality, with their mental outlook. Their reality acquires a certain tone depending on their attitude. Figuratively speaking, certain weather conditions are set. There may be morning freshness in the sunshine, cloudy skies and heavy rain, or even a raging hurricane and natural disaster. To some extent, reality is created, as is commonly thought, as a result of a person's direct actions. Thought forms are no less powerful, however. It is just that their impact is less evident. In either case, the majority of problems are caused by a negative attitude to life. The mess that is created on the metaphysical layer then has to be sorted through on the physical level, which complicates the issue. Overall, the picture of a person's separate reality depends on how they position themselves in relationship to everything that surrounds them. At the same time, a person's frame of mind is conditioned by what is happening around them. So what we have is a closed feedback loop. Reality is created as a reflection of an individual's thought forms, and those thought forms, in turn, are greatly determined by the reflection itself. When a person stands in front of a mirror, they focus all their attention on the mirror without trying to look inside themselves. It turns out then that the ruling role in the feedback chain is played not by the image, but by the reflection. The person finds themselves under the mirror's power because they are mesmerized by their own copy. It does not occur to them that they can change the original. It is specifically due to this obsessive focus on the reflection that we actively get what we do not want. Usually, our negative feelings have a total grip on our attention. We are absorbed with the thoughts of things we would prefer to be different. We think about the things we do not want, and we do not want the things we think about. That is the paradox. The mirror does not take into account a person's willingness or reluctance. It simply conveys an exact reproduction of the content of the image, no less and no more. 
it is quite absurd. People voluntarily lug around with them the things they cannot stand. The saying should not be, my tongue is my enemy, but my thoughts are my enemy. Despite its absurdity, this is how things are. What happens when a person feels hate? They pour their entire heart and mind into the feeling. The sharp image is perfectly reflected in the mirror, filling the layer of that person's world. Whatever you hate, you will encounter in your life in abundance. This causes one to be even more irritable, which in turn embellishes the intensity of the feeling. Mentally, a person reaches a point where they are ready to tell everyone to get lost. Bugger off! The mirror then returns the event like a boomerang. You told everyone to bugger off, and they did the same to you. Does this cause the number of problems to escalate? You bet. If you stand in front of a mirror and shout, Go to hell, the lot of you! The reflection you will see in the mirror is yourself going to hell, along with the rest of your world. In the same way the object being condemned penetrates the layer of the prosecutor. Imagine this typical example. An angry elderly lady treats the whole world with bitter reproach. She, of course, is the perfect embodiment of strict and infallible justice, clear in conscience before others and her own soul. The rest of the world must answer to the fact that it has not been exactly to her liking. A clear, sharp picture is drawn with immense precision. Looking in the mirror with an attitude like this, the lady creates the equivalent reality in the world around her, i.e., total injustice. How else should the world respond? It does not judge or justify itself. In its inherent quality, the world becomes exactly as it is imagined to be. Exactly the same thing happens when you are reluctant to accept something. For example, if a woman is sharply averse to those who drink alcohol, she will be fated to encounter drinking at every turn. She will be constantly confronted with drunkenness in all its various manifestations, as extreme as actually marrying an alcoholic. The greater the wife's aversion, the more intensely the husband will turn to the bottle. The husband may try to give it up occasionally, but his wife hates drunkenness with such vengeance that she actually savors it and insists. You will never give it up. Unless the husband has solid steel intent, the wife's insistent aversion will end up instilling her thought form into the layer of his world. The tendency for pessimism is a fairly unattractive quality. The mood of, well, it's not going to work out anyway, is kind of like a sadomasochism. The pessimist gets a certain perverted pleasure from reveling in their sorry lot. The world is so bad, it could not get any worse. It's going to hell and taking me along with it. The pathological habit of getting a kick out of negativity develops alongside a tendency to bear grudges. I'm such a nice person. You just do not value me. It's so unfair. That's it. I'm insulted. Do not try to talk me out of it. Soon I will be dead, and then you will be sorry. And where does this get you? The picture of fatal misery is not only reflected in the mirror, it is firmly consolidated. The bitter man orders a script for failure and then celebrates. You see, I told you so. All the mirror is doing is delivering the order, as you wish. With the same mood of fatal doom, the loser states their unenviable position. Life is just darkness with no light at the end of the tunnel. They would not want to be stuck with this fate for anything, and so they spend all their thought energy on whining and complaints. What else can the mirror reflect if the image is nothing more but an expression of dissatisfaction? As the image, I am unhappy. I do not want to. Such is the reflection. It is true. You were unhappy, and you do not want to. Again, the reflection is purely fact, no less and no more. Dislike of oneself is just as paradoxical in nature. It is self-generating. There is one golden rule that can be included in the textbook for complete idiots. If I do not like myself, I do not like myself. However strange it may seem, this tautology embodies a principle that is followed by the majority of the population. Take external appearance as an example. You may have noticed that most small children are very sweet and attractive. So how is it that so many adults are dissatisfied with their appearance? It is all to do with the mirror that sends back all complaint. Those who grow up to be beautiful are those who admire themselves. That is the secret. These people are ruled by the principle, if I like myself, I will have all the more reason to like myself more. It is quite another matter when an image tells its reflection, I seem to have put on a little weight, I need to lose a few pounds. The mirror will dispassionately reply, yes, you are fat, you need to go on a diet, or I have become a bit skinny, I should build up some muscle, to which the response will be, yes, you are puny, go and do some weights. Reality responds like an echo, confirming what it has heard. 
This is how inferiority complexes are generated. Low self-esteem is followed by a corresponding verdict, which the mirror manifests as reality. I do not think I have any particular talents. It is true, you are mediocre. I do not think I am worthy of the utmost happiness. Indeed, you have nothing to hope for. If in addition to all this, a person has an innate feeling of guilt, their goose is cooked. Am I to blame? Must I carry out my duty? Yes, you deserve to be punished, and you will be. How could it be otherwise? If a person feels guilty, even subconsciously, some form of retribution will be reflected in the mirror for certain. Do I even need to say that stress and fear are realized just as instantly? People are afraid of so many things, many of which do not occur because it would require too much energy for them to be materially realized. Accidents and catastrophes always represent an anomaly in the alternatives flow when the balance has somewhere been disturbed. However, if an unfortunate event lies in the vicinity of the flow, it will undoubtedly take place because people attract it with their thoughts. Doubt, however, has the opposite effect. Unlike fear, which focuses a person's attention on the possible realization of a given event, doubt is more concerned with what does not happen. Obviously, in many cases, as if despite us, our doubts are confirmed. Yet why should it seem that things happen as if despite us? In reality, the mirror is simply reflecting our own thought content, nothing more. In any case, the desire to avoid something greatly increases the likelihood of impact. Everything then seems to happen in defiance, which usually causes the individual to be in a state of irritation most of the time. Irritation completes the overall picture of one's mental outlook. The result is an integrated image. I feel uncomfortable. The individual's reality is organized accordingly and is created in such a way that the feeling of discomfort is maintained or exacerbated. It is because of their own negative attitude that people paint the layers of their world black. Any attitude that is fueled passionately by the heart and with the conviction of the mind will be reflected in reality. Moreover, the attitude will be literally replicated to perfection irrespective of what a person is actually trying to express, attraction or aversion. Here we can see the fourth mirror principle. The mirror cites the content of the relationship, but ignores its orientation. How do people react when they see that things they do not want are being realized? Rather than looking at the image, they focus all their attention on the reflection of the image and try to change that. The reflection is physical reality, and in physical reality, your actions are limited to inner intention. This means that if the world is not listening to you and you cannot make it go the way you want it to, you have to grip it by the throat and drag it with all your strength in the direction you want it to go. A difficult task, to say the least, and in some cases, quite impossible. It is totally absurd to stand in front of a mirror, trying to catch your own reflection in the hope of making something of it. Inner intention attempts to change a reality that is ready and realized by means of direct action. The house has already been built, but not as you would have liked. You have to take the house apart again and rebuild, but the end result is not quite what you wanted either. Sometimes it can seem as if you are at the wheel of an uncontrollable car. The brakes do not work, and the engine either stalls or roars in fifth gear. The driver tries to fit in with reality, but the car is totally unpredictable. It would seem logical that if you want to avoid an obstacle in your path, you should turn to the side. However, quite the opposite is true. From the moment that the dangerous obstruction has captured your attention, a collision becomes inevitable. You turn the wheel in one direction, but you are carried in the opposite direction. The harder you press on the brakes, the more quickly you slide into the skid. It turns out that it is not man who rules reality, but reality that rules man. It is like the feeling you might remember from your distant childhood when you were running and shouting with all your might. The world does not want to listen to you. It is so insulting. I remember times when I did not want to hear or understand anything. I just ran and screamed and my shouts were intoned by the thud of my feet on the ground. Do you remember ever doing that? Why was I so stupid and obtuse? Grown-ups were trying to explain something to me, but I have absolutely no desire to comprehend what they were trying to say. Everything has to be the way I wanted it, full stop. Now I'm a grown-up myself, but nothing has really changed. I did not learn anything. I'm still stamping my foot and demanding that the world listen to me. But the world does everything despite me, so I run and shout as I used to do. I run to meet reality, but the wind of inner intention blows in my face, and my efforts are in vain. Reality is controlling me and forcing me to react negatively like an oyster, and this just makes everything that much worse. So how do you control this crazy car? What should people do and where are people going wrong? The mistake we make is that we stare at our own reflection 
This is the whole problem. This is what we should be doing. First of all, we have to end the chase after our own reflection and stop for a moment. This means dragging our gaze away from the mirror and letting go of the inner intention to shift the world in the direction you want it to go. In this moment, the crazy car will stop in its tracks and reality will also stop. Then something incredible will happen. The world will come to meet you. The world comes to you. The ordinary human mind tries unsuccessfully to impact the reflection in the mirror when what is required is for it to change the actual image reflected. The image is produced by the nature and focus of a person's thoughts. The problem is that people look first in the mirror and only afterwards express their relationship to what they have seen. By doing this, deliberately or not, they express an intention that exacerbates reality. The tendency for negativity brings even more negative traits into the mirror. The individual layer is painted in gloomy tones and is filled with events that will be unpleasant for its owner. When a person falls into despair, the dark clouds in the mirror gather even more. If you take an aggressive stance, the world will instantly put its hackles up. You may notice that when you got into an argument with someone and sharply expressed your discontent, something else equally as unpleasant will follow on just as soon afterwards. The more irritated you get, the more insolently new problems seem to cling to you. Everyone will annoy you with something. People are attached to the mirror by the threads of importance, for everything that happens in the mirror represents our life and so has great personal significance. People either like what they see or they do not. Either way, the content of their thoughts corresponds with a reflection which continues to strengthen the existing situation. A person will be dependent on their surrounding reality to the extent that the image is controlled by its reflection. The greater the intensity of your feelings, the more powerful your attachment to the mirror. It does not matter what you are thinking about something. What is important is what you are thinking about. Whether you like the reflection or not, you are still focusing on it. Only the content of the thoughts has any meaning. Aversion is always focused outside of ourselves. Leave me alone, or I am so sick of it all. Irrespective of its nature, your relationship is still focused on the object of your dissatisfaction. The passionate feeling which is born of unity of heart and mind gives the image sharp contours, and as a result, the reflection begins to be dominated by everything that corresponds to the content of the image. This is why the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. People admire themselves in the mirror of life and each subjectively states what their reality looks like. This reality pulls you in like a swamp. It is like the old woman in line waiting to pick up her pension, or a tired woman carrying heavy bags on a crowded bus, or a sick person being passed from one clinic to another. It is their thoughts that keep them tied to their gloomy reality. At the same time, someone else is enjoying life. The sea, yachts, travel, posh hotels, expensive restaurants, whatever their heart desires. In every case, whatever the nature of the circumstances, the same fact is stated. This is how we live, whereas it should be, we live in the manner in which we think about our existence. The mirror confirms and continues to strengthen the content of our thought forms. The standard objection to this explanation is that supposedly the starting conditions are different for everyone. One person is born in poverty while another inherits a fortune. Of course, the starting point counts for a lot and determines how the image of one's life will initially be positioned and how it will develop later. But it does not mean that every one totally depends on the startup capital. There are loads of examples of how people who were born into the lowest levels of poverty ended up in the highest circles of society and vice versa. Perhaps these are just rare examples that prove the rule. That may be true, and yet, if it is possible for there to be an exception, the rule cannot be as immutable as you might think. Whatever dark hole you might find yourself in, know this. You can change everything, and what is more, you can change it radically. It doesn't matter that you have absolutely no idea of how to bring about that change. You do not have to be able to see any specific way out. The solution will present itself. You think you are at the power of circumstances you are incapable of changing. Yet this is an illusion, a sham that you can easily destroy if you want to. The thing is that we are all subconsciously walking around in a closed circle. We observe reality. We express our attitude towards it. The mirror consolidates the content of our attitude in reality. In order to transform reality, all we have to do is break the circle. You look at the reality of your world and you feel as if change is impossible. And in some ways it is, because you try to influence your reflection with inner intention, which does not have the power to significantly change anything. 
There are too few opportunities this side of the mirror. On the other hand, you do have the capacity to control your relationship to reality, and then outer intention can take things into its hands. There is nothing outer intention cannot do. There are alternatives to the development of events on the other side of the mirror, of which the human mind cannot even conceive. In order to launch the mechanism of outer intention, the fifth mirror principle has to be fulfilled. Switch your attention from the reflection to the image. In other words, you have to take control of your thoughts. Think about what you want and are striving to achieve rather than the things you do not want or try to avoid. Look once again at the closed circle formula. People literally move around the mirror circle like a donkey chasing a carrot on a stick. Attached to the mirror with its attitude, a primitive response to reality, the donkey tries just as unpretentiously to catch up to the reflection in his striving to change something. Now let us see what happens if we reverse the mirror circle. We express our attitude. The mirror consolidates the content of our attitude in reality. We observe reality. So where does that get us? The primitive and impotent statement concerning the reflection ends and is replaced by an intentional and goal-directed statement of the image. Rather than habitually expressing dissatisfaction at what I see in the mirror, I begin to create an image of what I would like to see. This is the way out of the mirror maze. The world stops and then comes out to meet me. I'm not running anymore. I'm standing still and watching my reality come to me, and a different wind is blowing in my face. Now it is the wind of outer intention. This time I did everything the other way around. I ceased the futile chase after my own reflection. I let go of the world and let it turn by itself in accordance with my thoughts. The mirror circle is still a closed circle, only now I am not turning circles. The circle spins by itself, driven by the power of outer intention. Outer intention is substituted by inner intention because I abandoned the attempt to influence the reflection. I simply form a deliberate and desired image in my mind and the dual mirror realizes the corresponding sector of the alternative's space in reality. The only difference lies in the fact that the situation will appear strange. It is strange that the element, we observe reality, is placed at the very end of the circle. People are more accustomed to behaving according to the rule of, what I see is what I bang on about. They send their attitude out into the world and the world returns a watered-down version like an echo. I really hope it is not going to rain. Rain, rain. I do not want to study. 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 I do not want to work. 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 As a result of the purified content of an attitude is what is materialized as physical reality. You can imagine the kind of monologue the mirror would be having, tired of all the confusion. You do not feel well. Okay, so what do you need in order to feel better? You do not want to do what you are doing now. Perhaps then you could begin to explain to me what you do want. You do not like what you have now. Then tell me, dear, what do you want? It is very simple. You have to change the negative attitude to a positive one. Make an inventory of your thoughts and remove all the not particles. Dissatisfaction, reluctance, disapproval, hate, lack in belief in success, etc. All these emotions have to be shoved into a rubbish sack and disposed of at the dump. Your thoughts should be attuned to the things you do want and like. Then only pleasant things will be reflected in the mirror. It needs to be understood that favorable reality will not be created instantly. It requires patience and awareness. Nothing will be the same again. Now you no longer react to the reality of your life. You take command and deliberately send your chosen thought forms out into the world. In contrast to the visible negative reflection, you are expressing a positive attitude. It is a little strange, but what is better? To be the victim of the power of circumstances like normal people, or to determine your own fate as you see fit? A person's mood is usually formed as a reaction to unfolding circumstances, be they favorable to your success or not. As a rule, the tendency for negativity keeps a person's spirits at a low point. You have to do the opposite and consciously create your mood. Even the knowledge that you are capable of shaping your own reality raises the spirits considerably. With my intention, I chose the colors for my reality. Irrespective of the circumstances in my life, I do what I need to do to feel upbeat. I do this consciously instead of reacting in a primitive manner to external irritants. This has to become a habit. Slides, visual or musical, whatever you prefer, can help to create the right mood. Ideally, it should be a picture in which your goal is reached and you feel marvelous. However, be prepared for there to be a period of time in which you do not notice any change in the layer of your world 
or the opposite might happen. There will be change, but problems will creep out from under the floorboards just to spite you. Why? These are just temporary inconveniences related to the move to a new level of relationship with reality. You will recall that the mirror works with a delay factor. You just have to stick to your guns no matter what and quietly hold the pause while nothing is happening. It should literally be like in the fairy tale. If you look around, you will turn to stone. I let whatever is going on in the mirror in the meantime be, for I know that the mirror does not have any choice. Sooner or later, it will have to start reflecting the image I create in my thoughts. If I do not succumb to the temptation of looking around and am resolute, my reality will be created in the mirror. Everything will be the way I want it to be. Your mental outlook should be as it would be if you already had what you wanted or were just about to receive it. Remember, the mirror materializes whatever is contained in your thoughts. For example, if you are dissatisfied with your external appearance, you take no pleasure in admiring your reflection in the mirror. All your attention is focused on the less attractive traits that you dislike about yourself and which you state in your mind. You have to understand that what is reflected in the mirror of the world is your relationship to yourself. Make it a new rule not to look into the mirror of the world, but to glance or peep into it. Ignore the negative stuff and search for the good and let everything you perceive pass through this filter. Concentrate your attention on what you want. What did you do previously? You made a statement of fact. I'm fat and ugly. I do not like myself like this. The mirror consolidates this fact. It is true. You are those things. Now you have a different task. To search only for the wanted traits in yourself and simultaneously create a picture in your thoughts of your desired image. From this moment, this is all you do. You just look for constant confirmation of positive change. Things get better every day. If you practice this technique regularly, you will soon be left with your jaw dropping from surprise. Basically, you have to create the relationship first and then only glance in the mirror and do not do it the other way around. Naturally, it takes a little time to get used to it, but the game is worth the candle and a job worth doing is worth doing well. Now reality will not control you. You will control reality. Even taking account of the inert nature of material realization, very gradually the reflection will be transformed into a positive one. The layer of your world will become so filled with good things that you will not have to convince yourself to have fun. The mirror circle will spin easily and spontaneously. The important thing is to get it moving in the first place and then get it to pick up speed with your intention. It will all be downhill from there. Surely not. I do not believe it, the boring reader will say. If only it was all that simple. Do not believe it if you do not want to. Turn around if you so choose, and a good journey to you around the mirror circle after your reflection. Who knows? Maybe one day it will catch up. However, if you do not believe it, but would like to believe it, then all I can say is that belief is not required. You do not need to believe. Just practice the recommended technique, and you will see the consequences for yourself. For the normal state of consciousness, these things will always remain inaccessible, because the workings of outer intention are discreet and inconspicuous. The mind will never understand how a dream it considers unattainable can come true. It will never believe it to be possible until it is right up against a realized fact. Let the mind be. It is okay for the mind to be pottering about in a room of doubt while you get on with what you have to do. Yeah, right. It's not working, the lazy reader will say. Indeed, the mirror technique is too simple for us to believe in its efficiency. Indeed, the mirror technique is too simple for us to believe in its efficacy. We are used to having to find complex solutions to difficult problems. People find it hard to believe that their thoughts really do affect the shape of reality, and so these things are rarely taken seriously, and as a result, they do not try. This is the first reason for the absence of visible results. The second reason is the usual lack of methodical action. Usually people are instantly inspired by some idea, but then lose feeling of enthusiasm just as quickly as it appeared. There are no miracles here. It requires doing a certain amount of work. Only this time, the work has to be done with the head and not the hands. Does the mirror which works with a delay factor really have a chance to shape your reflection if all you do is stand in front of it for a fleeting moment and then run away? Now that you are acquainted with the main mirror principles, all that remains is to put them into practice. It really is very straightforward. In order for a thought form to become established as physical reality, you have to produce it methodically. In other words, you have to regularly run the target slide around in your mind. 
Unlike an impractical dreaming that it enters your mind randomly, this is a specific task. By taking control of the feelings that tie you to your reflection, you are freed from the mirror. It is not about suppressing your emotions, for these are just a consequence of the relationship. You have to change the essence of the relationship, the manner in which you perceive and respond to reality. Once you have your freedom, you acquire the ability to create the type of reflection you wish to see. In other words, by managing your thought process, you manage your reality. If you cannot manage your thought process, reality controls you. The process of taking control of reality can be approached with varying degrees of intensity and application. Using an amalgam is the simplest and easiest method. It enables you to create a general background of comfort and well-being, which in the majority of cases is quite sufficient. Realizing a dream demands more patience and focus. Anyone can use the mirror technique to the extent which their needs require it. There is nothing new about the idea that our world is a reflection of our thoughts. It is as if everyone understands the idea implicitly, but at the same time it remains vague and ambiguous, and so there is not much practical benefit from such knowledge. What should you do and how should you do it? Few people have the time to work towards spiritual enlightenment, comprehend the secrets of the forces of nature, or develop their own. Now, though, you have a specific technique at your disposal. You understand how it works and how to use it. Stop running around the mirror circle and you will see that the world will come to you. The Maker's Intention So, in order to see the reality you desire in the mirror of the world, you have to take certain elementary steps. Intentionally shape the corresponding image in your mind's eye, paying no attention to the delayed reflection and peeking at it only in search of any new manifestation of the emerging reality. The thing is that even when you are aware of the delay, it can be quite difficult to get used to this quirky mirror. The idea is deeply rooted in our consciousness that reality is either instantly obedient as if we are holding a stick to it or cannot be controlled at all. We think that if a desire is not fulfilled right this moment, it is not possible for it to be realized at all. You cannot do what cannot be done. People are then resigned to the idea that all they can do is dream and that magic is something inaccessible or transcendental. We are all accustomed to the idea that magic must be something set apart from reality. The world of fantasy is somewhere out there in the beyond or in our imagination while real life is here. There is no getting away from it and you cannot change it. Magicians and people with extrasensory abilities also live in a special separate world while we ordinary people, with our ordinary problems, are left to trudge through this gray reality. In truth, there is no such thing as magic. There is just knowledge of the principles of the dual mirror. This knowledge is not hard to access. In fact, it is so transparent and unsophisticated that it could never fit with the canons of the magical. And yet, Aladdin's lamp looked like an old can, and the Holy Grail was not made of gold. Everything that has greatness is inconceivably simple. It has no need of decoration or secrecy. In contrast, it is always the things that are empty and useless that are hidden under a veil of magnitude and mystery. Once magic has been integrated into the mundane and relieved of its fairy tale attributes, it ceases to be associated with the realms of the mystical and the secret. When magic takes its place here in everyday life, it loses its fascinating element of mystery. The wonderful thing about the transformation is that everyday reality in turn ceases to be everyday and is transformed into an unknown reality which can be controlled as in a waking dream as long as the mirror principles are observed. You may already be acquainted with the transurfing method and know how to work with a target slide. Time is passing but nothing is happening. It is the same feeling as when you send a letter and wait ages for a reply. The mind becomes restless with impatience. You begin to wonder whether you might not be doing it right, or whether it is all in fact a load of rubbish. But the world does not stop, and the process of reflection being materialized in the mirror continues. It is just that the process is subtle and imperceptible, and so it appears as if nothing were happening. At this stage, the scales in the mind shift between the knowledge that the mirror reacts with a delay and the old habit of observing an almost instant correlation between direct action and the consequent result. What does the mind think when it perceives no visible result? It thinks that the action taken is ineffective or wrong. So what then does the mirror reflect? Exactly, it reflects the same. The process ends up being slowed or taken to a different direction. 
You can imagine the mind having this kind of dialogue with the world. I want a toy. Of course you do, darling. But you promised. Well, yes, you asked, and I said that you would have your toy. You seemed quite satisfied that you would have it. You misunderstood me. I want a toy right now, this minute. No, I understand you perfectly. You want it now. So where is it then? Exactly, where is it? One of us must be an idiot, undoubtedly. Damn it! I totally forgot that you were nothing more than a stupid mirror. How can I talk to you? Then I remembered. You are giving me a toy. Okay, okay, my sweet. So shall we go and get it then? Of course, dear. Come to me, and I will carry you. And then they set off to get the present that was so desired. Now all that remains is to have a little patient and devote your time to happily preparing for the occasion. The heart sings, and the mind rubs its hands in glee. Why should not they be satisfied, for they are going with the world to buy a toy? The transurfer will understand that the choices a person makes are transformed into an indisputable law that will inevitably be fulfilled. All it takes is to focus your attention on the end goal. Yet people are never satisfied. Do you think we are going the right way? I do not see any shops here. Do not worry, dear. We will be there soon. But when? I think we have taken a wrong turn and ended up in some back streets. Do you think? Yes, of course. We are lost. Whatever you say, Pumpkin. You know I always agree with you. Stupid mirror. I knew I should have never relied on you. Where have you brought me? I wanted to pop into the park on the way and push you on the merry-go-round while we were out. People feel unsure of themselves when they are led blindfolded. The mind just cannot come to terms with the fact that nothing is happening or that events are not unfolding as they had expected. The mind is like a cybernetic machine. When the work algorithm is disturbed, a red light comes on. The only difference between them is that the mind creates its own program or scripts, naively assuming that it can account for all future variables in advance. The primitivism of so-called common sense lies in the fact that it not only chooses a stereotypical program of action, it also insists upon it. In the moment that the choice is made and the final goal image is set, the mirror of the world receives the order and sets about realizing it according to a specific plan. Only the mirror can know how the image's reflection will be formed, as the means is inaccessible to the mind. Yet when the mind sees that the events are unfolding according to some strange scenario, it sounds the alarm and the individual then takes the world by the throat. For surely something must be done about it. The person thinks that nothing is working out, which begins to distort the target slide. On top of all of this, the person then takes action to support the scenario they consider more fitting and again ends up hindering the realization of the other plan they cannot fathom and yet would lead them to certain success. It is as if you snooker yourself with your own ball, or as the Russian proverb has it, it won't fit in the box, it won't come out of the box, and it won't give the box up. By taking a deadly grip on their own version of the script, which they feel sure must represent the path to their goal, the person prevents the goal from ever being realized. But that is not all. The irrepressible desire to have the toy as soon as possible pumps up so much excess potential that the mirror is literally distorted, and what good is the distorted mirror? Desire of itself is essential because without desire there would be no striving, and if you could add to this the resolve to act, you have the will to achieve your goal. But if you add doubt plus fear of failure to the mix, you end up with longing. This is the importance that has to be consciously reduced. Of itself, desire does not create tangible excess potential. It is only a problem when your doubts and fear make you take the world by the scruff of the neck. People usually think more or less along the lines of, I want to, but I'm afraid it won't work. Carrying the self-imposed responsibility of success or failure is a heavy yoke and causes people to place harsh conditions for themselves and the world around them. They make excessive demands on themselves and have high expectations of life. As a result, the mirror is distorted threefold. I want, I fear, I can't let go. It is a distorted three-way mirror. If you think that intention means firmly demanding what you think the world owes you, the results you want to see will elude you. If you request that the world give you what you want, you will still end up with nothing. It is important to understand that all you have to do is make an order and allow the world to carry it out for you. You just will not permit the world to do so because of your demands, requests, fears, and doubts. In response, the world also demands, requests, 
fears, and doubts perfectly reflecting your condition, for the world is just a mirror. You have to get a sense of this feeling. Let the world go, allow it to be a comfortable place for you to be right now. It is a subtle, fleeting feeling that passes quickly, but it must be caught hold of. Imagine for a second something incredible. Imagine that the hostile, problematic, difficult, and inconvenient world has become joyful and comfortable. You can allow the world to be so. Whether or not you do so is up to you. It is not a matter of being happy by default. It is about allowing happiness to enter your life. We are only as happy as we allow ourselves to conceive of the possibility of unbelievable luck. You do not have to force yourself to be happy. You just have to allow yourself the luxury of being so. Trust the world. It knows best how to reach the goal and will take care of everything. You do not usually concern yourself with the question of how a normal mirror can produce such a perfect reflection, do you? When you stand in front of a mirror, you only think about what you would like to see in the reflection. The mirror of the world works just as precisely, only with a delay. Just in case you do not yet feel confident that you really can rely on the world, there are two more mirror principles. It may be that some people find it easier to act following a set of instructions. However, before we move into the sixth and seventh principles, let us quickly recall the fifth. Let us suppose that you have determined what your goal is and began working systematically with the target slide. You understand that the results will not be instantaneous, and yet your mind is fidgety. Time is passing and nothing seems to be happening, or things are happening that you did not expect. In these moments when your mind is full of doubt, activate your conscious awareness. You have forgotten the rule, turn around and you will turn to stone. Your attention must be focused on the end goal as if it had already been achieved. The world comes to you while you are focused on the image. As soon as you turn to the reflection in the mirror where God knows what, or nothing at all, is happening, the world stops and you resume the exhausting and fruitless run around the mirror circle. You have to constantly remind yourself that the mirror works with a delay and requires a certain pause while it puts the reflection together. That is while the image is materialized into physical reality. For the time the pause lasts, you have to stick to your guns and believe in the conditions and in success when it seems as if everything is going down the pan. What you eventually receive will depend on how courageous you are in not giving in to despondency. This is true magic, stripped of magical attributes, but having real power. You should only turn around to look in the mirror, i.e. express your attitude toward what is happening, to note positive shifts, and to allow yourself to experience a pleasant feeling of surprise. In other words, your eyes must be wide open to anything that gives evidence of the world moving toward your goal and firmly shut to accompanying an inevitable negative phenomenon. If you have the tenacity to not look back, then as a rule the results will exceed your highest expectations. You will not only be given a toy, they will spin you on the merry-go-round and treat you to an ice cream. In a general sense, the rule for how to use the mirror can be expressed in the following way. When looking in the mirror, do not try to move the reflection. Instead, try to move the image, your relationship to it, and focus on your thoughts. In other words, move yourself. Do not try and catch your own reflection as a kitten does when it plays with its double, not understanding that the double is its own reflection. A song by the famous musician and philosopher Boris Grebenshikov contains the lyrics, She knows how to move herself to her full height. Spinning around your axis, you observe that with some delay, the world begins to slowly turn after you, but you do not rush to grab hold of it and make it spin. This is the difference between inner and outer intention. Inner intention forces you to try and have an impact on the reflection. Outer intention is about leaving the mirror alone and concentrating your attention on your thought forms, thereby having a true power at your disposal, a power capable of moving the world. What will we do, Mama, when she moves herself? The secret to this power lies in letting go of your grip. The human mind meets any circumstance it had not foreseen, and the slightest deviation from its script with hostility. A reaction promptly follows that is just as natural as it is primitive to try and correct the situation, to object, refuse, insist on one's own way, to argue, make sudden movements, to be proactive, etc. Basically, the mind grabs at the reflection and insists in having its way. Of course, when your attention is glued to the mirror, you succumb to the illusion that you only have to reach out your hand, and reality, which is so close you could touch it, will instantly submit to your will. 
No such luck. The silly little kitten is deceived into playing with an ordinary mirror, and yet man who stands one rung higher in consciousness falls into the exact same trap. The only difference is that the illusion of the dual mirror is more sophisticated. That is all. It is essential that you keep your hands away from the mirror and allow your world to move. In the majority of cases, no proactive action is necessary. It is enough to be mild and flexible and go with what is happening. As you may recall, the alternative's flow will direct events along an optimal course if it is not hindered. The primitive mind is inclined to slap its hands about in the water and row against the current, insisting on upholding its own ideas. Now, in order to free yourself from the illusion, you have to turn around the short-sighted intention of the mind, making it dynamically correct its scripts to include the unpredictable. The task will be new and unfamiliar to the mind, but it is the only way out of the kitten role. The six mirror principle sounds, release your grip and allow the world to move with the alternatives flow. Inner intention will then turn around and move in the opposite direction, which brings us to the following paradox. By abandoning the position of control, you acquire real control over a situation. Try to observe all that surrounds you with the eyes of the observer. You represent part of a play and at the same time you act in a detached manner, noting any movement in the set. If someone offers you something, do not be quick to refuse it. If someone gives you a piece of advice, think it over. When you hear a different point of view, do not be too quick to enter into debate. If it appears to you that someone is doing something wrong, let it go. If circumstances have changed, rather than sounding the alarm, try and embrace the change. Whatever you are involved in, take the simplest course of action. If you have to make a decision or choice, give preference to the option that comes most naturally. This does not mean that you should agree with everything wholeheartedly. It is one thing to close your eyes and let yourself be taken by the power of the current, and quite another to be consciously and intentionally moving with the flow. You will sense when you need to tighten the reins and where you should consciously give some slack. Let the world go and then observe how it moves. Watch the world as if you were a wise mentor, allowing the young pupil freedom of choice, only occasionally giving them a push in the right direction. You will see how the world begins to spin around you. Now has come the time to introduce you to the last, most important, and powerful of the mirror principles. Aside from the capacity for impeccable reflection, the mirror has one more quality. In a mirror, right becomes left, and space that stretches far into the distance seems to move in the opposite direction. People have long become used to this quality and have learned in their mind to transform illusion into reality. However, the mind still has not managed to overcome the challenge of the illusion of the dual mirror. The problem lies in our tendency to see the bad in the good, and to turn the positive into the negative, and to perceive one's good fortune as an evil lot. In reality, the world is not intent on machinating against its inhabitants. Problems are not the norm because they require a greater expenditure of energy, and nature never wastes energy. The alternative's flow always takes the path of least resistance. You could say that it follows the path of fortuitous circumstances. The majority of problems are caused by the individual slapping their hands about in the water and rowing against the still current. The main thing, however, is the tendency for negativism that generates a corresponding image which the mirror streams into physical reality. Remember, all the world does is reflect your relationship to reality with total precision. However gloomy the reflection appears, it will only become darker if you treat it as something negative. Likewise, the negative can be transformed into the positive if you declare it as such. Any circumstance or event carries an inherent unfavorable as well as beneficial potential. By expressing your attitude at this crossroads, you determine how events will unfold further, successfully or not. In the long run, you will always end up winning, even in the most unfavorable of circumstances, if you observe the seventh mirror principle. Embrace any reflection as positive. Whatever you see in the mirror, you can never know for certain whether it is for your good or to your detriment but you can decide to choose the best for yourself. Moreover, when things do turn out well, do not take it for granted or remain indifferent. Be glad, express your pleasure, and sharpen your awareness of the fact that everything is going so well. Whatever happens, everything is unfolding as it should. This is none other than the principle of coordinating intention, which was described in detail earlier in Transurfing.
For example, imagine that you face some kind of problem. When you first encounter the problem, it is as if you are standing at a crossroads where only you can decide whether to declare the problem complex or straightforward. The tendency for negativism and weariness from the burden of life force people to bow under the yoke of their problems and sorrowfully state, Oh, how difficult! What a complex issue! The world instantly agrees, as you wish, my love. The world always complies, so given that this is the case, it makes sense to do the opposite and tell yourself, Everything is being sorted out very easily. Even if you do not really feel it, declare the problem straightforward. Let this be your postulate. For in essence, the problem is only made complex by one small detail, its accompanying circumstances. The small detail is determined by your relationship to the issue. Whatever happens, the world will again agree to everything. Is everything going to pot? No, not at all. Everything's going great. And although you may appear a complete idiot to any sane and sober individual, rub your hands in satisfaction. It's all fine. Clap your hands or make a little jump of pleasure. Then you will soon discover that circumstances that previously seemed detrimental are actually ace cards in your hand. This mirror quality always has such a sudden and unexpected impact that you never get used to it. Every time a failure turns to victory in your eyes, you will experience a feeling of incomparable delight, making you want to cry out. No, you do not say. It is magic. Previously, from the point of view of common sense, you would have reasoned quite differently, which would have accounted for all the full range of hardships and privations you previously had to experience. From this moment onwards, every time you come across any kind of problem or unpleasant situation, remember that whatever the circumstances, the world will comply with the nature of your relationship to what is happening. Whatever you wish, my dear. Do you see what you now have at your disposal? You no longer have to sit and wait for the bluebird of happiness to feign to visit you, or for the wheel of fortune to turn in the right direction. You are the master of your success. You use your will to declare any event or circumstance beneficial and to your favor. This approach goes beyond just relying on the goodwill of the world to take care of you because it loves you. The entire world is one dispassionate mirror, and if it takes care of something, it is only because you are looking at it in that way. Neither is it a case of confidence which circumstances could shake at any moment. Nor is it self-assuredness that comes from blind faith in success. It is not even a matter of being optimistic by nature. It is the intention of the maker. You create the layer of your world. You are the maker of your reality as long as you know how to move yourself without denying the world its own freedom to move. To move yourself means to follow the last three mirror principles. The maker is not so much an active agent as an observer. The will of the maker is different in that it does not subordinate, it allows. Now you know how to work with the amazing dual mirror. You need no longer fear the things of the world that others would consider hostile, problematic, or intractable. The world is yours. Take it by the hand and say to yourself, my world and I are going for a walk. The League of Mirror Makers It would seem that the question of fate in the context of transurfing is covered. People have free choice of their future by virtue of the existence of the alternative space, which can be controlled by applying the principles of the dual mirror. Nonetheless, it is worth elucidating on the theme a little more. Opinions differ. Some people think that fate lies in the hands of its owner. Others believe that fate is predetermined. Yet others go even further and view fate as a personal lot we are doomed to, delivered from above and determined according to our deeds in past lives. So which point of view is closest to the truth? They all are. All these views are correct and equally well-founded. Could there really be any other way in a world which represents a mirror? Everyone that stands in front of the mirror receives confirmation of the image in their thoughts. There is no point in asking the mirror whether the reflection of your face is destined to be happy or sad. On the one hand, the mirror reflects what is, and on the other hand, I will become however I wish to see myself. Therefore, the issue of fate is a question of choice, to choose a predestined fate or to prefer your fate to be free. It is all a matter of conviction. Whatever you choose is what you will receive. If a person is convinced that their fate is predetermined and that there is no escaping it, then indeed, a foregone scenario will indeed be realized. In the alternative space, there undoubtedly exists a separate stream along which the little boat of life will travel if you set it adrift to the will of the waves. 
The one so doomed gives in to infantile wallowing and reverently raises their head to face the skies where arrows of misfortune rain upon them like cones from a pine. O oh, power of providence! O oh, right hand of fate! In reality, it is not so much written in the stars as stamped on the forehead that they are a fool, simply caught up in a subconscious and pointless dream to which they have condemned themselves. When a person takes hold of the reins, their life ceases to be dependent on circumstances. The little boat can be taken in any direction away from the allegedly predetermined fate. It is all very simple. Life is like a river. If you take to the paddles and row, you can choose your direction, but if you simply give yourself to the current, you will be forced to drift within the stream you find yourself carried by. If karma is what you want, karma is what you will get. Believing that your lot in life hangs on inexorable circumstances or the mistakes committed in a past life, this is the alternative you stream into reality. It is your will, for you are the Son of God. And yet, if you desire to become the Maker, then this is also within your power. The dual mirror will agree to anything. It all comes down to whether you know how to work with it. This all makes good sense within the context of transurfing model. The only unsolved mystery concerns the alternative space. Who placed all that it contains into the alternative space? Where does the alternative space come from and why? And what existed prior to the alternative space? To be honest, I don't know. I can merely put forth the following hypothesis. No one created the alternative space. It had always existed. It is the nature of the human mind to assume that everything in this world was created by someone or something and has a beginning and an end. And yet it would appear that this is not true of everything. I am afraid that even if human awareness was raised enough to surpass that of an oyster, it still would not be sufficient to philosophize on such matters. There are things in this world that lay far beyond the capacity of the mind. For the mind, despite being capable of abstract thought, is really just an apparatus of logic. The level of my abstract thinking allows me only to construct a primitive mathematical model. If you were to take a person's conventional level of awareness to the level of infinity, by which the level of awareness would represent a dot, the question we have posed would be reduced to the following. Why is it that I, a dot, can occupy any position at all on the coordinates plane? Who created the coordinate grid? What is it for and who existed before the coordinates grid? It is all quite incomprehensible. And if you were then to tell the little dot that aside from the second dimension, there is also a third dimension and an n-dimension space, you would quite simply blow its mind. It is easier to believe that fate is preordained by a higher power and that it can be calculated or foretold than to believe in the existence of some unfathomable alternative space that contains absolutely everything. Either way, no one likes to live with uncertainty, and so people try to get some kind of hint about the future, turning to astrologists, fortune tellers, and hierophants. This is also a question of choice. What is my intention? To know what to expect? or to co-create what I want. If you choose a passive position, then of course, all you can do is turn to another who has the audacity to claim that they can read the Book of Destinies. Yet, is that even possible? Is anyone really capable of foretelling or calculating the future? Undoubtedly, they are. Moreover, this is possible due to the existence of the alternative space. Where else can clairvoyance source fragments out of past and future? There is no doubt that events cannot develop randomly. The sectors of the alternative space are linked in chains of cause and effect, lifelines which are subject to given laws. How can these laws be evaluated? Evidently by certain external phenomena, such as the position of the heavenly bodies, dreams, a card layout, and even coffee grounds. There is no such thing as coincidence. The notion of coincidence is merely a special way of perceiving an effect in the absence of detailed information relating to the cause. Yet once again, it is by the very virtue of the existence of the alternative space, this archive of film on the past and future, that the prognoses are often far from accurate. There are an infinite number of alternatives, and so there is no guarantee that the film reel taken off the shelf is destined to end up in the projector. Any prognosis can only ever rest on a portion of probability. One of the most accurate was the Bulgarian clairvoyant Vangelika Dimitrova, known throughout the world as Venja. Or Vanga. Losing her sight in her early years, Vanja acquired the gift of seeing the alternative space. 
Yet even with her unique abilities, the number of accurate hits relating to the past as well as the future varied in the range of 70 to 80 percent. Prophecies can also be distorted by the perception of the individual psychic and their subsequent interpretations. The Centuries by Nostradamus is to this day given wildly different interpretations. People try to see in prognoses things that are not really there and the opposite. They fail to notice the obvious. When Vonja foretold that Kursk would sink, no one could understand what this meant, for Kursk is located a long way from the ocean. Yet when the submarine of the same name sank, those who knew of the prophecy must have come out in goose pimples. So, if we can only talk about the chances of a psychic seeing the right sector in the alternative space in terms of probability, then how do we explain the fact that the level of accuracy turns out to be relatively high? This has to do with the fact that once a prediction has been imprinted into a person's memory, whether they desire it or not, that prediction becomes their intention. An individual's relationship to various interpretations and horoscopes is a very personal thing, and it is made of a balance between belief and mistrust. On the one hand, people are not generally inclined to rely wholly on such things, and on the other hand, somewhere in the depths of their subconscious there is a thought that asks, what if? Importance in one's attitude towards predictions is minimal, as we tend to think that it may come true or it may not. It is like a game that is played simultaneously for fun and in all seriousness. As a result, a kind of underlying unity of heart and mind emerges providing the conditions for a sharp, if fleeting, image to be created, which the mirror of the world willingly transforms into reality. Unbeknownst to themselves, the individual also begins to manifest what they have been foretold, which explains why the level of probability in such cases is higher than average. Vanja's biography creates the impression that she intentionally programmed her future fate early on in her childhood. Her favorite pastime was to heal her neighbor's children, her patients. She was good at telling various imagined stories which her audience listened to as if under a spell. Aside from that, Vanja used to enjoy another curious little game. She would hide something in an obscure place and then begin to search for it blindfolded, feeling her way towards it. As you can see, the pictures of the images she created were so precise that the mirror of the world recreated them in physical reality. Vanja became a healer and clairvoyant after she lost her ordinary power of sight in an accident. When she was just 12 years old, she was carried away in a hurricane and found later in a field covered in sand. It should be noted that Vanja was convinced that you could not escape your own fate and that no effort could change what was preordained. When she received visions of accidents that were going to take place in the future, she tried to avert the tragedy, but she was never successful in doing so. There were times when Vanja, knowing that death awaited someone, tried to persuade them not to set out on their journey or to leave a certain place, but it did not help. People did not believe her. This would seem to contradict the model of transurfing. Might fate be predetermined after all? In actual fact, there is no true contradiction here. No one person is capable of influencing the life of another with their own intention. People are endowed with the power to create the layer only of their own world. Even when, from the outside, it seems as if an influential politician has the fate of whole nations at their disposal, in reality, they are merely carrying out the will of the structure that created them. Everyone is capable of managing their own fate, but only under the condition that they take the wheel in their own hands. It all depends what position you take, active or passive. You can live as each day comes, reading the horoscopes and accepting your fate as if it was granted from above. On the other hand, you can really get down to business with all the diligence of foolishness and end up creating such a fate that heaven forbid should be bestowed upon you. Therefore, by active position, we take to mean the ability not to splash your hands about in the water or row against the current, and the intention to control your thoughts in accordance with the mirror principles. This position gives you genuine power over your fate, at which point the services of a seer become irrelevant. I'm not saying all predictions are false. Individual predictions are indeed often confirmed. The point, however, is that these services are only needed by people who decide to choose life as subconscious dreaming, and these will always be the overwhelming majority. Yet if you intend to transform your life into lucid dreaming that you can control, then you will undoubtedly no longer require the services of mirror makers. And who are the astrologists, hierophants, and prophesiers if not mirror makers? The predictions they give you are not just a harmless prognosis, but a surrogate part of your own fate, a small part of the mirror in which you will have a look. How could it be any different? 
it makes no difference whether you take the prediction seriously or not. Once you have heard it, the image will continue to occupy a place in your subconscious, programming your fate. Even if you place the issue of money to one side, did you really think that you could have a piece of your future just like that? There are consequences for taking a peek at the book of fate. The payment for these goods is always the same. You must take them with you and make them a part of your life, whether you want to or not. Such a payment could prove fatal. The blame, or shall we say responsibility, lies not with those who sell fate as a product, but with those who make the purchase. When you show interest in a prediction, you acquire a mirror, and you ask the mirror maker whether it be okay for you to smile in it that day. You already have a mirror, the layer of your world, from which you can create anything at all. In relation to my own mirror, I am free. If I wish, I can with the will of the maker turn any defeat into a victory, and that is how it will be, and I could not care less about psychic predictions. If, however, you have no desire to become the maker of your own reality, you can successfully make use of the services of the mirror makers. This also represents a choice and is one way of living, or rather, a safe way of moving along the stream of fate. Predictions can serve as signs that give warnings of possible unfortunate events, and they can instill you with a hope of success. In this sense, the mirror makers fulfilled a helpful role, although perhaps not all of them. The most harmful among them are those who foretell events of a global scale. By predicting forthcoming catastrophe and the end of the world, they attune large groups of people to destructive thinking, or in other words, they program the collective consciousness. This will inevitably leave its mark. What is interesting is that scientists are also part of the League of Mirror Makers, although they do not necessarily have a direct impact on the fate of others. Over the course of human history, scientists have worked on the one task of trying to explain how the world works. Once the earth was flat and rested on the hump of three whales, an elephant and a turtle or something like that, in former times the stars rotated around the earth. Many centuries have passed since then and some things have become clearer, but the process of trying to find a model that fits continues as before. Classical physics has been replaced by quantum physics. Objects of the micro world were first declared particles and then turned out to be waves who had no objection to being particles from time to time. Then came another theory telling us that these obscure objects are neither waves nor particles, but strings in 10th dimensional space-time. The world stands in the fitting room and agrees with this model too. Even then, something did not quite fit, something was not quite right. Scientists were forced to add one more dimension, the 11th dimension, as a result of which a supernova M theory is born according to which the string is transformed into a membrane. It is amusing, is it not? What will they think of next? No doubt this process will continue for infinity. Every new model will be found to replace the previous one. If you stand in front of one mirror and hold a second mirror in your hand, you will understand why the world has an infinite number of models. In the mirror in front of you, you see yourself holding a mirror, in which there is a reflection of you in a mirror holding a mirror, in which you see. Perhaps there is no answer to the question of how the world works. Within the context of the human mind, if one were to climb to the top of the most abstract peak in our range of definitions, we would see that the world does not actually look like anything. It is simply a mirror of our ideas. We get what we think about the world. The most we can confirm with any confidence is that reality is multifaceted, and then state a few of its laws. The process of scientific research into how the world works is similar to the example of the mirrors given above. When you take one natural phenomenon as a starting point, you get a specific version of a model which is like having one section of the mirror. Standing with that section in front of the main mirror, you see a new aspect of reality reflected. If you take one of the manifestations of that aspect, we once again get another version of reality. And again, out of yet another tiny mirror, a new one will appear having been reflected in the image of the mirror before that. So what is the world really like? You can try and imagine what the world is really like using the example of two identical mirrors placed opposite each other. Each mirror reflects the mirror that is placed in front of it. Both mirrors give the reflection of nothing, reflected an infinite number of times. It is a black infinity of images in which nothing is reflected from nothing. Does this picture fit any description provided by the concepts the mind has at its disposal? Hardly. 
To conclude, it should be understood that the pendulums of the mirror makers have no concern for your fate. They follow their own interests, which is to receive a constant source of energy from their clients. People would like to know every day what tomorrow has in store for them, and so they constantly turn to the well-informed, making a contribution with their energy, and in exchange receiving a surrogate, a piece of fabricated fate. If a person's attention has been caught in a pendulum's noose that is trading in fate, then they will not feel confident until they have read the next horoscope or had their next dream interpreted. They become addicted as if to drugs. They have to keep getting their dose to support their illusory confidence in tomorrow while the pendulums sway and blossom. Transurfing does not require the same source of energy supply. Learn about the principles and then do whatever you want with them. Knowledge in itself is not a pendulum. A pendulum is only created when the corresponding structure emerges. Neither does transurfing explain how the world works. It simply offers a utilitarian model which enables you to understand why it is possible that reality can be controlled and how. It is the same as being perfectly capable of driving a car without having the slightest idea how the engine was put together. Transurfing's mission lies in issuing the driver's license. The mirror makers try to convince the dot that it must move along a strictly defined line in the graph and that any other form of movement is just not meant to be. This will in fact be true, but only if the dot accepts these conditions. Reality exists independently of you while you agree to this condition. You can never change the entire world, but the individual layer of your world is fully at your disposal. You do not have to change yourself. It is enough simply to exercise your right as the maker. Now you have a dual mirror a bit like a genie that makes your wishes come true, except that it is not a fairy tale anymore. It is an aspect of reality that had perhaps remained hidden from you until now under the cover of routine. Unlike the genie in the fairy tale, you cannot command the mirror genie. There is no point in making appeals to the mirror genie or seeking his compassion. Yet as soon as you declare your intention, the magic mirror will willingly comply. Okay, okay, my dear. You are the true maker of your fate if you intend to be so. Do not give your fate away to the mirror makers. Summary the Mirror Principles The world, like a mirror, reflects your relationship to it. The reflection is formed in the unity of heart and mind. There is a delay in the reaction of the dual mirror. The mirror states the content of the relationship and ignores the nature of the relationship. Do not think about what you do not want. Think about what you are striving to attain. Release your grip and allow the world to move with the alternative's flow. Any reflection should be perceived as positive. You control reality by controlling your chain of thought. Cite the amalgam formula at every convenient opportunity. You have to move the image, not the reflection, i.e., change your mental outlook and the nature of your thoughts. Your attention should be focused on the end goal as if it were already achieved. To materialize a slide, you must turn it methodically in your mind's eye for a sufficient period of time. Do not suppress your emotions. Change your relationship to your problem.